Good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, institution, in, Institute for Government event on future leaders building a, a diverse and inclusive public sector. My name is uh, Alex Thomas. I'm uh, one of the programme directors here at the IFG. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, our work on the civil service and policy making. So uh, thank you to everyone who's uh, joined here today. Thanks to those online watching. Thank you to those in the room. Thank you to uh, our brilliant panel who I will uh, introduce uh, in a moment. Um, I couldn't help but make the sort of corny hackneyed link to the political events of <clears throat> this week. So uh, we've got a new prime minister, the country has a new leader, so it's a perfect time for us to talk about what makes uh, future leaders in the public sector. There you go, I've said it. We've, uh, we've got over that um, uh, particular uh, embarrassing moment. Um, but uh, more seriously, that prime minister is going to take lots of decisions about the approach that her government is going to take to the civil service and to the rest of the public sector. She's going to send out lots of signals about it. So it does seem like a good time for us to have this conversation about uh, how you build that diverse and inclusive leadership uh, in the uh, uh, public sector. Um, this is part of a programme that we've been doing uh, at the IFG over the course of the last year. Um, a series of private uh, events, roundtables, with people we were trying to identify potential future public sector leaders, uh, introducing them to current uh, public sector leaders, uh, and with a particular focus on those from uh, backgrounds that might be underrepresented in the public sector at the moment. So we've had a series of really interesting private conversations, uh, and we thought that it was uh, a, a great opportunity uh, to uh, bring those more into the public domain and to have a uh, more public um, uh, conversation about it. We're really pleased to have been doing those uh, uh, events, including this one with uh, PwC. Um, uh, and uh, uh, that's, you know, th that partnership has given us an opportunity to bring together bits of the uh, private sector uh, as well as uh, the public sector. So it's been a really sort of fertile piece of work for us. So we're hoping to share some of those uh, uh, insights today and to have a conversation uh, with this excellent panel. But before I go any further and before I introduce them, uh, I will hand over to Nancy Park, uh, who is the social value lead at PwC. She's going to say uh, things for a couple of minutes just to kick us off. Nancy. Fantastic. Thanks, Alex. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Alex says, I'm Nancy Park, partner at PwC and the firm's social value leader. PwC is delighted to be hosting and sponsoring this event today uh, about building a diverse and inclusive public sector. We know that the UK faces inequalities and challenges around fairness, and these challenges were highlighted by the pandemic and now likely to be compounded by the cost of living crisis. As a firm, we are really passionate about um, DNI. It's right and proper for all sectors of, so of our society to prosper. We create better and more innovative solutions for our clients uh, when we welcome diverse perspectives. And if we wish to build meaningful and lasting relationships and connections, then um, we need to, across our wide range of clients, across the public sector, major corporations, uh, both also small and medium-sized enterprises nationally and globally, then we really truly need a diverse cadre of leaders and staff. PwC's future of government research in investigated inequalities in society and the impact of COVID-19. I'm going to just share some of these findings with you before we kick off, because I think it's helpful to, to set some of that context. Uh, going beyond protected characteristics, we examined geography, social mobility, gender and race. The results included some notable findings, such as the majority of the 4,000 people surveyed agreed that COVID-19 had made social mobility more difficult in the UK and support urgent action to prevent the gap from widening further. Our research shows that a growing concern as well as a deepening generational divide in public attitudes towards social mobility. The most common barriers to these opportunities across all age groups are access to the right skills, uh, the lack of support network whilst growing up and disabilities. 70% of our respondents said that better quality and more affordable housing would be one of the most important drivers for levelling up. And although increasing the proportion of women in work offers a potential annual boost to the UK economy of 48 billion, only one in five women felt confident that they had the right skills to work in a green job. 
We also found that 56% of the people surveyed believe that racial and ethnic inequality is an issue in society, with almost one third agreeing that the pandemic had deepened divides. And ethnicity pay gaps we know exist across all UK regions. The survey also um, highlighted a lack of trust in government. Less than one in 10 of survey respondents trust that central government listens to people like me or takes, um, takes my needs into account when making decisions. So clearly, public sector must serve all people of all characteristics, regions and outlooks across the country. So whether a leader's role is in policy making or implementation, reaching out to different groups, um, different communities, then we need a range of insights and experiences uh, to, to, to bring um, to this. So public institutions need to become more diverse, including diverse representation at all levels of people like me, whilst addressing inequalities in um, society to build public trust. So I'm so pleased to see the future leaders of the civil service here today convening on such an important topic. And there's so much for us to learn from each other, from each other's experiences, uh, different perspectives, which is why I personally, and on behalf of PwC, uh, very much looking forward to hearing from our high caliber panel today uh, to help us with our journey uh, to build trust um, in creating a more inclusive and diverse workplace and society. Thank you. Over to you, Alex. That's brilliant. Thank you, Nancy. Really uh, helpful context, particularly on some of the, the gaps you highlighted between the public sector and uh, citizens, which I, th I think is going to be a theme through the, the conversation that we're, we're about to have. So really um, appreciate that. Um, before I introduce the panel, this is the first plug for questions. The way we're going to do this is we'll have a short discussion amongst the panel, uh, and then we'll go to, there's a roving mic for those in the room, uh, and for anyone online, uh, do uh, submit your questions through the link that you've got. If you can, say who you are and uh, where you're from uh, and if you're so inclined the hashtag for the event is uh, hashtag IFG future leaders so we'll be tweeting along uh, and uh, I am contractually bound to encourage you to do the same um, uh, so to the uh, panel, um, and it's a panel that's so good, we've broken one of our cardinal IFG rules and extended this event by 15 minutes. So just to warn <laughs> you now, uh, we're going to finish at quarter past three rather than uh, uh, three o'clock um, because we wanted to make sure there was enough time to um, have this uh, conversation. So uh, uh, starting from uh, uh, the far, um, uh, my far right, uh, we've got Ming Tang, who's the chief data and analytics officer at NHS England. We've got Councillor Georgia Gould, who's the leader of Camden Council and chair of the Leaders Committee of London Councils. We've got Bernadette Thompson, who is Associate Director of Inclusion at Barts Health NHS Trust and a former civil servant working on inclusion, well-being and employee engagement at what is now Deluxe. Um, uh, for how long? We'll see. Um, we've got Paul Cleal, uh, who's an advisor and non-executive board member for the Premier League, Guys and Thomas's NHS Foundation Trust and the Metropolitan um, Police. Uh, and we've got Rupert McNeil, who is former government chief people officer. So really pleased to um, welcome uh, all of them. So uh, I'll kick open with a sort of a few opening questions to um, each of our uh, panelists. And I'll start with you, Bernadette. Um, we want to, you know, this is all about sort of creating the conditions for success, um, uh, finding things that work. Uh, and I'm certainly conscious in, in my time in the civil service that we talk a lot about this subject. It's much harder to make it actually happen. So uh, you've got um, fantastic insights on how change actually happens and what stops it from happening. So can you kick us off with a few thoughts on that? <laughs> Thank you. How long do I have? Um, <laughs> but I think. I think the conditions for success right now in this current climate is really going back to basics, um, really, of trying to understand why we're talking about this and why we want to do this. You know, this is at a time where a number of, I know we've changed the cabinet today, I'm a, not a civil servant anymore, so I can say this. Um, we, we, at a time where some of, lots of our senior ministers and their advisors have badged a conversation around inclusion as being woke. Now, it's not helpful. Leaders need to talk about this responsibly. So for me, the narrative with some of our senior leaders needs to change. So, you know, just listen to Nancy, our PwC colleagues and other private sector colleagues, we know that we 
talk about inclusion because it, it, it provides benefits for the business. Now, in the public sector, uh, we're not in it for the money. Um, so why are we doing this? Aside the legal case, the moral case, the right thing to do is that we need um, to provide policies for the very diverse community that we serve. And how are, how are we going to do that? We need the most creative, the most talented, and the most diverse workforces. We need to ensure the public sector that our workforce feel that they can thrive, that they're not held back. And so we need to ensure that the outcomes for our workforce, workforce people are fair and equitable. And so I believe that once we go back to basics and get that right to know why we're talking about this and why we're advocating for a fairer and equitable workforce or society, then we need to look at the data. And I'm sure um, Ming will say a bit more of that. We need to look at our data, not ask for more data. We've got enough data. We need to look at our data intelligently and look at it a lot of the time across the employee life cycle and other facets of um, society. But Ming will say so much more on that, I'm sure. But then we need to have a double A approach, acute accountability. Where do the box stop? Who's responsible for this? If it doesn't go the way we need it to go, where do the box stop? You know, in the public sector, we've got loads of strategies. We've got strategies for everything. So it's not for the want of strategies. It's about taking radical action. We know that if we do the same thing all the time, we'll get the same result. So it's really going back to basics, holding where do the accountability stop? and taking reformed action. If I'm going to use the words of our new prime minister, with regards to our strategy, it's going to be deliver, deliver, deliver. Thanks, Bernadette. I feel that is something that's going to be quoted quite a lot over the next, uh, uh, next couple of years. But that's brilliant. Really struck there by a number of points you made about the, the responsibility, having a conversation in a responsible way, um, talking about the benefits uh, uh, and why uh, organisations might be doing it. Um, and obviously, very Institute for Government friendly theme, accountability, and uh, I like acute accountability. But building on that, Rupert, I'll, I'll come to you uh, next. As Bernadette suggested there, it's becoming a more difficult environment for the civil service and the public service, public sector to navigate. Um, what do you think, I mean, you were Chief People Officer of the Civil Service for um, six years, I think. Uh, what did the civil service get right? What's it got wrong? And what did you learn uh, uh, about the environment in your time? Thanks, Alex. I think I'd basically separate it out into two parts, signal and noise. So look at the signal, first of all. Over the past 10 years, building on things that had happened previously and uh, Gus O'Donnell and others, um, there's actually been a remarkable convergence on consensus. So when the new diversity and inclusion strategy uh, came out, uh, I think everybody could look at it, all stakeholders could look at it and say that was reasonable and it focused on the things that diversity inclusion is all about. You know, you need to be representative at every level of seniority in any organisation. You need to make sure that people feel safe in the workplace and that they're being respected in the workplace. So I think there was a huge amount of consensus on that, um, as well as a move into really focusing on outcomes and where the operational problems were in the process. And I'd say this to people who are leading or starting leadership roles or management roles. d and is a really good place to start because you can get onto your processes and look at whether or not they're creating the outcomes that you want to create. So take an example. One of the embarrassing things about the civil service fast stream uh, in about so 2014, 2015, was that there was a woeful underrepresentation, I think actually zero, of black British of Caribbean entrance into the fast stream. Now, the data showed us that, we we're measuring that, and then we could actually take quite mechanical action at every stage. And you know, what did it show? Well, it actually showed that the pro parts of the process that were not automated, the ones that involved human beings, uh, were the ones that we needed to deal with. You know, our assessors, great people, were not representative of the people they were assessing, so we need to change that. So it got a lot more operational. Um, and a lot more um, real, I think, in terms of, of how it worked. So that's, the, that's one good thing. Another good thing is that I think the civil service has got less, um, uh, less bashful, perhaps, about saying that it knows what it's doing. Um, and one of the things that came out for me was the, the innovation around 
working with organisations like PwC and others on defining socioeconomic background. How do you actually measure it effectively? You know, we're an evidence-based organisation that wants to be objective. So how do we meaningfully determine that? And that was very useful. How do we meaningfully measure cult culture and inclusion, both quantitatively and qualitatively? So a great deal of innovation, which is now in this strategy, moving into areas like, well, we've talked about individuals. We talk a lot about the micro. We talk a lot about the macro, the whole system and the numbers there, but are we actually looking at diversity and inclusion at the team level, which is where most effective things happen? So that's all, that's all good. That's a signal. But there is noise, and uh, I'm going to be very balanced about this because I think the noise occurs on both sides. So there is, in the global diversity and inclusion debate, where I think we all hopefully agree on the outcomes, mostly, there is um, a tendency to caricature superficially the opposition <laughs> um, and to make more noise out of things where, frankly, there shouldn't be noise. So if I take two examples of that. So on the one hand, um, and many people, I would say, regardless of political alignment, can be um, very, very overtly anti-woke. And uh, that can be very unhelpful. It can be very unhelpful if it means that you deliberately or unconsciously and ignorantly conflate targets and metrics. Any system needs metrics. A target, a quota, a target is not a quota, and a target is not a metric. But you need metrics to know whether you're actually going to get anywhere. Equally, um, if you, uh, so I have two kids, a 28-year-old and a 21-year-old, and they are living in a, as, as the excellent British Social Attitudes Survey will show you, you know, attitudes change. It does matter what pronouns people use. People want to be treated with respect. And so that's, very, that's another important aspect of it. So that's one side of it. On the other side of it, on the side of um, uh, what those people might characterise as a woke, there are problems too. There is a real and frustrating tendency, particularly in the most senior leadership in multiple organisations globally, to virtue signal about DNI and not actually realise that they have the agency to change the processes that will get to the right outcomes. All credit, without sparing the blushes of PwC, for the way in which the big four have led the way on this, by the way. And I think that there is a real, uh, a real need to get in there and properly demonstrate that uh, as a leader, you want to change the whole, you want to change the system and get the right outcomes. And I think the, um, you know, the other side of that is that it can, it can degenerate into performative wokery and you get uh, a vicious circle. So huge, huge plus marks, I think, for, um, for what's actually happened. But I, I would like the noise to die down and people to accentuate the signal. Thanks, Rupert, and uh, admirably balanced. You can take the civil servant out of the civil service. <laughs> uh, uh, there we go. No, but thank you for framing it in that way, because I think it's a really helpful way to, to navigate this subject today as well. Paul, I'll come, come to you uh, next. And, uh, the you know, many striking things about your CV, but you've seamlessly navigated the public and private spheres. So I thought I'd kick off with a question to you about um, your experience uh, of how the public and private sectors have dealt with um, uh, and responded to uh, some of the questions that we're talking about today, similarities, differences, what works, what doesn't work? Yeah, my CV is a bit of a mess, as you say. Um, <laughs> I've probably, probably got several, several versions. Um, and yeah, not just the public and private sector, but also uh, the third yeah. sector. So I did a few years in local government before joining PwC, 21 years there. And then since then, the last five years, um, I've covered a number of non-exec advisory roles in a university at Kingston where I was deputy chair, a National Citizen Service Trust for DCMS, um, Guys and St Thomas's in the NHS, which I've actually just, just recently left um, uh, this summer, um, <coughs> Metropolitan Police um, as well. And then I've been involved in the private sector, um, particularly with football, with the Premier League, um, which is probably in some ways at the far end of the, the private sector in terms of competitiveness and and certainly the amount of money spent um, recently. Um, so, there's, so there were lots of common factors, um, but there are some differences too. And, and if you were, I think diversity and inclusion, if, it, if it's taught me one thing in the 20 or so years I've been involved in it, it's not to make generalisations. So I'm not going to say the private sector is better than the public sector. Um, 
there's a slightly different question, which is, does the profit motive make a difference to this? And I would say, yes, it probably does on balance. Um, and I think uh, if you're trying to persuade a private sector organisation to do things differently, you need to have um, a reason that's good for the business. And that's actually, I think, quite healthy. It gets you away from stuff around, it's the right thing to do, um, which can be helpful because often, um, to the people who are kind of opposing change on the diversity front, if you say we should do this because it's the right thing to do, they'll say, aha, so we're gonna get people who are not as good then. And that, that's, a, that's, that's been played back to me lots over the years. And I think, um, for me, it's always been about primarily meritocracy. And I think businesses have got better as they got more diverse. PwC certainly got better as it got more senior women involved. And I think it's got better as it's got more people from different you know, backgrounds involved, both socially, uh, although I think the firm also always had a good source of people from all sorts of social class backgrounds. But it's definitely got more women at the top, more people from minorities at the top, uh, which has been very positive for its, you know, for its success. And I think you know, football's been interesting because um, you look at it, I've, I've always watched football a lot, but I've been always, almost more interested in what goes on behind the scenes. And when you, you see what happens on the field, when I first went to watch Crystal Palace in the 1970s, everybody on the pitch was white and British. And the standard of, that we have now in the Premier League is, is the best in the world, and it is the most diverse in the world. And there are people from everywhere. Um, it's incredible. Now, what then happens, if you will cross the white line off the grass, into the offices is it completely changes because the definition of merit in jobs off the field including coaching is not as clear and it's easy to talk about meritocracy and i think i discovered at some point that actually you could talk about meritocracy and reach very very different conclusions about who you should employ and i think you know when rupert says you know that these very good people in the civil service were coming up with um surprising answers you say in terms of lack of representation it's because people have a, have a different concept of merit in their minds and they use proxies and sometimes the way people speak the way they look are proxies for merit when they're not actual merit and i think a lot of what i've tried to do over the years is to try and get people to see past that um, i know pwc recently have uh, taken away the requirement for a 2-1 degree for example previously removal of a level results when you've already got a degree all these things were simplifying factors filters that enable you to to make decisions and and i think um, Probably in the best private sector organisations, more progress has been made. Um, but there are lots of private sector organisations for whom, you know, they're still quite a long way behind. And I think um, if you're looking for, for clues as to what drives performance, I think larger organisations are often better, um, particularly ones that require large um, intakes of graduates. Um, these, these young people you interview now, you know, are, are kind of rather more demanding than I was. You know, I just want, I wanted a job. Not, now, now they come and tell you how to do your job and, and which job they'd like, and it better be the head of strategy quite soon. Um, it's, so it's a very different market, and they are driving change, and they have expectations about pronouns and other things, and they have expectations about climate and environment that um, you know, I just didn't ask when I was in that position. So, if you're exposed, public or private sector, to the graduate market, I think that's a very healthy um, signal that you will be required to change whether you like it or not. And you will not get the right people, the best people, if you don't. So I would say it's more to do with the type of organisation and the pressures you face. Accountability, if you like, but accountability to customers, accountability to shareholders all makes a difference. And I think where some public sector organisations haven't quite got it right yet is because they haven't quite got clear about perhaps that accountability. I don't think, for example, NHS trusts are as accountable locally as, as, as local authorities are. And I think it's not surprising you see more, I think, diversity in senior levels of local authorities than you do NHS trusts. Um, but there's lots for the public sector to gain here. Um, I think there is the internal side, which is about recruitment and retention and progression of people and trying to get um, representation at all levels. But there's also this customer aspect. And I see it in you know, in the NHS with the figures around, um, I mean, the question, are you giving the same service to everyone? Take race, NHS, um, you're four or five times more likely as a mother, black mother to die in childbirth. Um, in, we found in our trust that people were being turned away disproportionately for being late. You know, the white person's late because the traffic, the black person's late because they're, well, you know, a bit lazy, and that was happening. So we had to stop everyone being sent away for being late because we couldn't be fair. 
Um, the police stop and search, classic example, nine times more likely of black male to be stopped than the white male. There are reasons for that, for part of that, but there's always an unexplained difference. And the point about the data is I think you've got to kind of work through the processes, and we certainly did it at PDBC, and obviously you've done it really well as well, to find out where it is in the process that things are going wrong um, and try and correct it. Um, so really, I think it's, it's those organisations that have the external pressures, whether it's reputation, whether it's giving public services, making profits, um, that will make more progress. And I think in some cases, the public sector perhaps yet can't manage its concept of merit as well in the services it delivers. Um, and, and I think perhaps that's where it, it would build a stronger case for change. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah, the best private sector organisations are probably ahead, um, but there are still, you know, I'm sure if you're running a hedge fund in uh, somewhere offshore, it's probably still um, quite... Uh, quite narrow in the field of, uh, that you're recruiting for, but you're still making quite a lot of money, so who cares? Um, so I think it does come down to those external pressures, um, including the people you recruit on the inside, um, but I, I wouldn't make a, too many strong generalisations that, that one is better, mm. but I do think the public sector's got, got more to do. Yeah. Uh, Interesting, really thought-provoking points about, for me, particularly the context and the incentives there and how they mm. play out in different environments. Looking forward to talking a bit more about that. Thank you, Paul. Um, Georgia, you, you might want to pick up on some of those points as well, because it touched mm. on lots of, lots of your world. But the particular uh, question I was going to throw to you to kick off with is, quite often there's a tendency for this conversation to uh, look internally at organisations and absolutely rightly look at staff and recruitment and, 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 and so on. Um, but there's also something, you know, there's an important theme here about um, inclusive, you know, inclusion in how policies are applied and how services are, 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 are delivered. And I mean, certainly from your perspective, your take on what, what inclusive policy making, what inclusive uh, operations and delivery means to you from, from, from Camden, but also your broader yeah. experience. I mean, I think the two are deeply linked. I think there's no doubt that having a more diverse workforce leads to better decision making. And you know, just a concrete example of that, uh, when the pandemic started, we were starting to hear from our, from our councillors and our staff who were um, from Bangladeshi and Somali heritage that there was a disproportionate impact on those communities. But the data wasn't telling us that. We had some massive gaps. You know, the, the, um, we, don't, we didn't at the time record ethnicity on death certificates. We couldn't tell through our hospitals what was happening. So the data wasn't telling it, but that community insight was coming directly into the council. So we were able to respond really quickly with targeted public health support and listen to that lived experience. And I think if it wasn't in the heart of our organisation, would we have heard it so quickly? So I think, I mean, I think it absolutely matters for, for better decision making. But I mean, I think for me, that at the heart of inclusive policy making is that the people who are impacted by those policies are part of designing them and implementing them. I hate to say this with lots of civil servants here. I think we're quite addicted to centralisation in this um, country, and uh, we need to devolve power much closer to communities. But that doesn't just mean to, to local authorities. That means thinking radically differently about how we actually deliver services. And uh, there, you know, there's so much money wasted and and poor services delivered because we're just not designing them alongside people. And sometimes that sounds really woolly, but actually, if you think about the power that the state has over people's lives, and so to take kind of, I think, one of the hardest edges of state power is the ability that councils have, and I'm from a local authority background, to, to remove children from their, from their families. And, you know, they go, you know, that's a traumatic experience for, for individuals and, and for staff. And in Camden, that was something we started to look at really deeply, and we brought together a group of parents who had had their children taken away by the local authority to look at everything that had gone led up to that in the system, what had gone wrong, and what could we learn. And those are really hard and courageous conversations for both sides, for staff, you know, who, who to kind of try and step out of defensiveness, but for, for parents to come back into an institution that had led to, you know, such, such a deep trauma. But that experience we learned so much from it and and as a result of of their work have, have deeply transformed our services and you know one 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 thing they told us is something that we you know sounded really good on paper we have multidisciplinary team meetings we bring together lots of different agencies um to to look at uh, child protection the kind of experience of parents in that room is lots of different professionals telling them that they're failing um and you know how dehumanizing that, that they found that 
So we've been working um, with our families on something called family group conferences where we work alongside the wider family, sometimes community around, an, uh, around a, a child or sometimes a, an elderly person or somebody receiving adult social care services. And we work with that, that group and professionals are part of that conversation, but they step out of a room for the conference and, and the group decide together how, how they'll support that child. And what's extraordinary in that is you have things come out that are beyond the imagination of any individual and resources and assets are found in the community uh, that the, 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 the professionals would not have, have found on their own. But it requires a really different way of working. And our staff often talk about relationships. They, they have a motto, to love is to act. And um, you know, we don't often hear love in, mm. when we talk about policy making. But actually, it's, it's deeply powerful, the, uh, working alongside them. We have parent advocates now who are the, themselves people who've been through the, the child protection system. And um, uh, again, you know, that can sound, it can sound very willy, but we had the Treasury come into Camden to, to try and understand why we were one of the only local authorities that were seeing numbers of looked after children decrease um, without changing our thresholds and why, um, and, uh, why we were consistently under budget. And I think it's quite traumatic for them that what they found was not, you know, <laughs> spreadsheets, but a story about relationships and love and handing over power to communities. And we recently had Ofsted in who gave us outstanding. So you, you know, we, we've not stepped back on those, on those, uh, on the really important safeguarding aspects, but you can deliver services really differently. Um, and I think it, to take a step back, you can also think differently about how you develop policy. And I'm a, a real advocate of citizens' assemblies, which bring together a diverse group of, of citizens to, to um, deeply um, uh, uh, discuss and deliberate about an issue. And in a community like mine, which is very unequal, over 40% of children grow up in poverty, but we have a very affluent professional um, uh, residence as well. There can be a real power imbalance between uh, of who gets heard and who has the time and resource to engage. And so making sure that everyone is part of that conversation, that they're listening to those different trade-offs, um, you, you always get better decisions. But, you, but you know, they're resource intensive and you have to invest in the capacity of citizens. And I think sitting in one uh, assembly, one of the best moments for me was a young person who kind of said, I only came for the voucher, but it turned out to be the best thing I ever did. And that's what you need. Not like weirdos like me who go to a meeting, you know, on a Tuesday night because for the fun of it, but people who wouldn't turn up, um, but who are supported to, to be part of those deliberations. So uh, you have to, uh, people, you know, sometimes that's, that's people getting, you know, paying people for their time and recognising that poverty is a real barrier to engaging. Sometimes it's ensuring that there's qualifications and we're doing some work uh, with Central St Martins and, and UCL in Camden on a civic university where, where people who give their lived experience to, to, uh, to decision making get a qualification at the end of that that they, that they can take into the labour market. Sometimes it's about making sure there's a translation service or you're giving people, somebody a laptop and digital skills to engage. It, it, you know, it requires uh, real investment and it also requires an organisation that is open to that way of working and investment in a diverse workforce and a culture that really deeply listens. Um, but when you do kind of go down that path, I think the results can really be transformative. I'm talking about Camden's journey, but there are, there are examples, I think, all across the country about where services are being transformed in that way. Brilliant. Thanks, Georgia. Uh, really sort of tangible, bringing the, uh, sort of the, the concept, some of the conceptual points we're talking about down to... Uh, down to tangible examples that I'm also uh, very attracted now to an IFG event on love and the treasury. I think this is, <laughs> this is definitely the way we need to go. They have a banner um, that they can yeah, bring. <laughs> definitely. Well, fantastic. Um, Ming, uh, uh, you've been uh, sort of um, uh, previewed a couple of times in terms of the, the data and uh, how we can analyse uh, the data that we have and what data we might, um, we might need. Um, how can we measure the inclusivity of public services? I mean, uh, and the other thing it would be really interesting to get your reflections on is sometimes there is a bit of a sense that the search for ever more data can be used as an excuse mm. not to do something or not to act. So that's, that's the subject we thought we'd uh, throw to you. Thank you. And Bernard said we have loads of data. <laughs> Georgia says we have gaps. We have both, right? We have lots of data, quite often the wrong data. Quite often the gaps are because people are hesitant to make sure their actual record is correct in those things, right? Because there are notions out there that if you 
put your ethnicity or your um, preference or whatever, then you're going to get discriminated against on the basis of actually having that recorded. So we need to be conscious of that. Um, but data is really important because without it, the, there's two halves, isn't there? We started the conversation around the war for talent, really. How do, you, how do you attract, recruit and retain really good people? Well, if you don't have the data on where you're always going for the, that talent, you're never going to change that. One of the things that we found, and I used to work for Accenture, one of the things I, we did in Australia was very much work with schools, and this is something that we're starting to do with the NHS, actually, is because, actually, I looked at my data for data and analytics. It's really hard to have black Caribbean data analytics people out there when you actually recruit. The numbers are so low that come forward. So that means you can't just carry on saying we want to look for more. You've got to do something more fundamental, and that is actually going down to the schools and making STEM subjects actually of an interest for that population. I do quite a lot of stuff with women and girls and STEM subjects, but really making sure that we're looking at both those barriers, but actually collecting that data and using it so that you can actually build the case. Because a lot of this is about building the case, isn't it? You know, making sure that you know, the war for talent is expensive. You know, we have such long turn, great turnover. If we don't attract those people, those people that come forward because you've given them a chance because they didn't have the best qualifications because they, they didn't get a two one or whatever they didn't. You know, I always said when I joined Accenture, I would never have gone through the graduate scheme I joined at a later stage because I didn't go to the top university. I did get a two one, but you know, I didn't come from that type of family. It doesn't mean that you couldn't do the job. So actually having people in positions who can actually reflect that is really important. Having people that actually understand the things around languages, the things about poverty. What we found during COVID was we did track that information and we did find out which communities weren't coming forward. And actually working very closely with local authorities, we went back to say to the communities, what do we need to do differently? And it was about, can we have the vaccination in the church? Can we have the vaccination as a drive-through rather than coming into hospitals? You know, we can't ha afford to take time out to queue into GP surgeries. So let's have drive-throughs at the weekend, longer hours, or at you know the supermarket, so that actually people can come forward. That's the type of thinking that we're now wanting to do in the NHS, which is very much. If you want to be inclusive, the integrated care boards actually give us an opportunity to work much more inclusively and learn from local authority colleagues on how to get the communications out there with the communities to do that. But again, to do that, we need to build the public trust to track the data, to collect the data and to use it. What I think people get really upset about is when, when your data comes in and nobody knows what you've done with it. Nobody, you, know, you can't prove to them or the percentages are so bland they don't really mean anything. You know, these things need to be meaningful. And what we have found is making the stats meaningful so that you can target and only do the analysis so that you can take action. So a big part of this is not just collecting data for data's sake, but what information do you need to make decisions and what are you going to do differently with that information? And that means that you have to look at the process. You have to look at who's getting involved and do you have the right people in the room? What workflow do you need to make it stick? Because this isn't just about sticking numbers out there or a strategy, it's actually making it stick. Therefore, you need to know if, you know, if the answer is the Bangladeshi community aren't coming forward for their vaccination, who's actually going to take the action to go and talk to the Bangladeshi community and then how they're going to come back and how are we willing to listen to that and make the change in that action. So I'm really passionate about using data for action rather than using data for statistics. You know, statistics are important, but I think if you frame it as an action, then it's much easier to make the case, both for the public and for the people doing the analysis that what they're doing is actually meaningful and useful. Thanks very much. I mean, great sort of yes, data for action, squaring the uh, squaring the circle um, uh, that I uh, asked in my question. So thank you. I'm going to go. Um, we've had a good kind of round there. I'm going to go straight to questions now. We've got um, lots coming in already online, so do keep uh, keep sending those in. But I'm going to I'm going to kick off uh, in the room. 
Um, and uh, ask if anyone has got a question for the panel. Go there at the front. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is David Nart. I was the clerk of the House of Commons for some years. Um, and it was really about graduate entry that I wanted to ask. And, and Ming said something that, if I may, you, you wouldn't have got into the Accenture graduate program, and now you're running the NHS data and analytics. Um, my understanding is, is that Fast Stream has been abandoned by the civil service for a year. That's wrong. For one, for one year. I wonder if that's quite a good thing. Um, I have to say this, we lost faith in the Fast Stream entry system. Uh, so we introduced, as many departments did individually, I think, a direct entry graduate scheme. And I think in common with departments, found we got a much more diverse uh, and in the end, um, more effective group of young people coming forward. I couldn't understand why that was, um, but I wondered what lessons there might be about graduate entry generally in, into the uh, professions. I don't know if it applies in local authorities in quite the same way. Thanks, David. Rupert, do you want to kick off yeah, from so, the so other thoughts? A great, uh, a great point, and I think I, 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 I agree. So the Fast Stream has an amazing brand, it's actually a brand that's covered multiple configurations over multiple decades. Right now, my colleagues when I left anyway, <laughs> were um, working on the next big reshaping of that to take account of the fact that we now have functions, different professions, and addressing some of the issues which, uh, which, which you've, ref you've referenced. So you, know, you, you need to keep going, and we are competing against great organizations like PwC and others um, as well, and we are one of the largest, still, the civil service, one of the largest graduate recruiters. My frustration, actually, with this is that we have a really good route in to uh, the world of work, which is increasingly academically challenging, uh, which is through apprenticeships. And what the big four and other organisations have been doing is they've been shifting the balance, I think, of their recruitment to apprenticeships. And I mean, in a way, I would love to see this process, the fast stream is great, but do you actually make it more inclusive and have it including apprentices? Do you have it um, as uh, an equally strongly branded um, apprenticeship offer? Um, and also it's interesting too about who joins the fast stream because I think about, I think first of all, many people apply on several attempts, they don't get in the first time. And I think the average joining age is probably around 27. It's quite interesting. It's not, yeah, it's, quite, it's not what one would expect. So I think the, um, it has a place, but I would love to see apprenticeships um, as actually the dominant way for people to come into to those roles. And for those people, this is the key thing, to accelerate up into uh, the upper levels. I think that deals with some of the issues about safety and economic mobility that the civil service should be a great engine for supporting. Thanks, Rupert. George, will you say something about local government? And then I've got a question online I'm going to direct at Bernadette, which because it sort of links into some of this. But, Georgia. Sure. I think um, that local government does have graduate entry schemes in Camden. We have our own. But I, I couldn't agree more. I think that there's been a real investment in apprenticeships, not just for young people coming in, but for people of all ages who are coming back into work. And I think certainly in Camden, we've been on a on a journey, um, you know, led by our data that shows that showed a kind of mm. significant ethnicity gap. So over the last five years, in, in transforming the way we recruit and how we go into communities, so targeted much more at um, our local community, you know, housing tenants and housing services and and, and so on, um, uh, uh, blind recruitment, and we've seen a real shift in 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 who comes through. So I think it's it's as much about the. The, the recruitment process and the effort that's that you you go into where you recruit what how you how you make it a lot easier um, and more accessible and demystify some of the roles because often you know we, when you talk to people in the community that they, they have all the skills um, you know but they 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 they're looking at a job title on it and they think that they don't and so just breaking down some of those barriers and you do see a real transformation. 
Thanks, Georgia. I said I'd, um, I'm going to work in the, it's the top-rated question uh, uh, online at the moment from Tia, um, which is how can the public sector continue to progress on diversity and inclusion when political preference would prefer to reduce DNI activity and staff in many parts of the public sector? Um, so we might sidestep some of the sort of politics of that, but Bernadette, the, kind of, if <laughs> I'd the, like to if the, I'm a nonsense. I'll direct that. I'll direct that one to you, uh, but. Um, but if you've, if you've got pressure to reduce the resources that's going into um, those teams, uh, how can people working in that in, 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 in maintain the momentum? I'll just ignore the headlines. Um, anyway, <laughs> um, I, I think what people are failing to understand, especially with diversity and inclusion, and I look at Rupert when I say this, is diversity and inclusion is a firm part of the HR profession. So are we saying we want to diminish a bit of the HR profession? Talent management is part of the H um, HR profession. So I think when we talk about these things, we need to be intelligent in our discussions. We're saying that our workforce constitutes human beings, people. So the first thing we need to think about, that what is the experience of our people? So, you know, what are we trying to do with inclusion? We're trying to make sure the lived experiences of our people, who are one of the most valuable resources, I'll use that word resources, within the organisation, who are going to help us to get the work done. And we know that if people are not engaged, if they're not motivated, if they feel they've been treated in a wishy-washy manner and, you know, lack of respect, we won't get the outcomes that we need. So I think we need to think about what is the role of a DNI person. And I think when we talk about inclusion, the first thing a lot of people focus on is representation. You know, oh, how many BAME people do we have? How many women? It's just like the discussion we've been having on uh, the TV today that, oh, the cabinet is fantastically ethnically diverse. OK, but 74% of those people went to a private school as opposed to, you know, a very small number that went to um, a state school. So when we're thinking about inclusion and diversity, we need to stop getting hung up on the representational angle. It's inclusion. People want to feel included. People want to be treated with dignity and respect. People want fair and equitable outcomes. So are we saying that by removing that from the organization, by removing that wraparound support for people as part of our HR function, HR is human resources. What are we saying? So I think we need to revisit, go back, to think about some of the things that we're trying to create as senior leaders. We need to be responsible in our language. HR is a profession. We are taking care of our workforce. DNI is part of that. So I think we need to think about what we want to do. I mean, Gordon Messenger's report, um, where he looked at leadership in the NHS, was absolutely brilliant. One of the things he did say, however, was that, you know, we need people, this needs to be part of people's day job. Yes, indeed, it should, but we are not at that point in a number of organisations where we're mature enough to just leave people to their devices. So we do need people like me, whose day job it is, to hold our senior leaders to account, to say, what are you doing, and have some of those difficult conversations, looking at the data, um, in the various sections to make sure we see the progress that we need and we, you know, within organisations. So for me, it's, it's about, um, it's a, it, you know, part of the HR profession. Um, we need to look at it that way and not like a standalone thing at the side. Great. Thanks, Bernadette. Let's have another question from the uh, floor. I'm going to go right to the back, if I may. I will come to others. But... Um, thank you very much. Uh, I have worked at the Treasury and I can confirm it is powered by love. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a civil servant. Uh, I was a fast stream assessor for 15 years, so I, I know a bit about that. I was also a school governor for more than 10 years, including recruiting the head teacher and several of the staff. Um, you, you talk about diversity in terms of representation primarily. Uh, what are your thoughts about diversity of thought? Diversity of thought. Who wants to take that one? Paul. Yeah, well, I think that's the source. Uh, I can't remember who said it, but that, that's the source of the benefit of diversity. I think Georgia might have said it. So diversity of thought is critical. So people often talk about cognitive diversity. Mm. I think what worries me sometimes is that it's often used as an excuse not to have people who look different in the room. Um, and actually, 
what they have is a group of people from similar backgrounds who have a certain amount of cognitive diversity. And if you introduce people with lots of different backgrounds, you would almost, by definition, bring in different cultures, you'd have much more cognitive diversity. So I think both diversity of thought, well, diversity of thought is critical, and it's the combination of different people around the room that gives you, that's where the magic comes, as Georgie was saying about her examples in Camden. Um, and including more people who have the confidence to speak in that conversation is important because if you only have diversity but one person dominates the conversation, that's not really giving you the benefit. So I think diversity of thought is critical, but you have to be aware it being used to cover up limitations you know, elsewhere. Thanks, Paul. Ming, I know you, you've got to go just before three o'clock, so I want to make sure I, you get a chance to uh, uh, make a couple more interventions. But um, data on diversity of thought? <laughs> <laughs> How do we go about that? Eh? I don't think we've actually classified that as a, as a data collection point. You may, I th I, in consultancy, we did do a lot of um, psychoanalysis on people. Yeah, so we, we probably do have that data. I don't think it's shared in, in the way or used effectively. But in diversity of thought, that is very much the style. So your working style, your preferences and those things, it's actually quite valuable to look at that data and I'm sure we do do it in recruitment and we do do it in you know the 360 type stuff but I don't think it's shared as much as it probably could do that is quite an interesting thought I hadn't really it hadn't really occurred to me I, I know Rupert wants to come in I just, yeah I, don't, yeah, I completely yeah. agree with what being said and I think it's a great it's a great point I completely agree I think yeah. the best leading indicator we have of it is background and diversity of background, mm. and it's only th and of everything mm. from work experience mm. to gender experience to, uh, to to all those things. So I think, but I think it also needs to be actively worked on. And I think this is the point about getting people to think about the team and how teams are organised, yeah. and to so we did come up with it is there a way of you know, building what we've done on a subsequent background inclusion. How would you actually try and track different forms of cognitive diversity, of which ex experience is one? Neurotype is another. Um, preferences, big five personality factor type is another. All of those, all of those things. I, I think, though, that you, to design it in, I'm a great fan of, I think, the Brad Pitt film World War Z, which I recommend. I love mentioning World War Z at the IFG. Is it powered by love? It is powered by love. Brad is always powered by love. But um, the, uh, you'll come across the concept of the tenth man and designing in diversity of thought in taking team decisions, and I think that's a really important thing and that's the next generation of inclusion is how I, do you get that do you think that's a really important point about taking that in in team decisions because it is that's where it makes most sense isn't it because i do think that if you have people from different backgrounds they will come with a very different perspective but some of this is actually processes, isn't it? It's actually exactly. thinking through how are you making a decision and making sure all the voices are heard before you make the decision. Because the one voice dominating the yeah. conversation stops all of that, mm -hmm. regardless of how good people are in the room. Mm -hmm. So it's actually being a bit more structured in your thought process and your decision making, and, and actually then how are you going to recruit? How are you going to track and monitor those decisions to see what the outcomes were? Mm -hmm. So I think you can use the data in that way. Yeah. Now, Georgia, I promised you a bit of politics. So we've got a question, which yeah. I think is politics in the right way, but uh, they haven't given their name, perhaps not surprisingly. <laughs> um, do you think political parties are not good for local government? Uh, <laughs> yes, the answer. We, were, we were often unable to deliver inclusive and positive policies in wards of most need. We were encouraged to ignore them unless they were swing wards. So, I mean, regardless of the specifics of that, I guess the, the underlying point there is, is there's something about the way we do politics, the structure of politics in, uh, in the UK that makes it hard to make progress in some of these areas? I, Big question. <laughs> huge. I think that politics, when it works well, should be about representation. I think the beauty of local government is you have a, a kind of mix of professionals who you know, understand their areas and local representatives who are accountable to a, to a community in a very close way. There's no hiding from your community. I live in my wards. If I leave the house, somebody's stopping me and showing me the pothole and, and so on. So it's very close. And I think, actually, when, I, when I'm working with the police and NHS, I sometimes think that they miss that because, you know, you've got, um, you're very, uh, you've got professionals, but they don't, they're not kind of forced to always go back to the kind of community side. So I think that creative tension between the two works well. Um, does it always? Absolutely not. And 
I, I, that's why I, I think designing in more deliberative and direct um, uh, uh, citizen representation to processes is so important. And it's built into a citizens' assembly. You know, we did one on the climate crisis, and you had people in the room who thought Camden Council persecutes car users and people who wanted us to ban all cars. And they're all in that space having a deliberative conversation. And I, and I think that that really matters, and it forces those of us who are elected not to just be dominated by a, a, a small passionate minority or uh, where, where it might be in a kind of political interest, but to to um, to listen deeply. So, I, you know, I think a kind of national change that should happen is that, like a jury service, every individual should go through some kind of civic um, civic jury or, or deliberative process, either nationally or, or locally, and that should be part of how we make decisions. I think we should... Uh, you know, through a kind of a new communities and a local government act, built in um, more community power to, to decision making, not not um, instead of representative democracy, but to work alongside it. Mm, really interesting. Anyone else want to come in, or we can go to a let's go to another question in the room. Uh, let's go on the end there. Hi, um, my name is Risha and I'm on the National Graduate Development Programme at Kensington and Chelsea Council and I'm also co-chair of the NG, one of the co-chairs of the NGDP Black Asian and Ethnic Minority Network. Um, my question was, as someone who is on like what's considered to be like a generalist graduate program and obviously one of the top ones in the public sector, like what can the public sector and each of its individual organisations, local government, civil service, NHS, etc um, like really do to attract people from diverse backgrounds and not just young people but people from all diverse backgrounds to this sector and then what can organizations do to really help them thrive because I think in a lot of cases people go to one organization and have start out as a generalist but stay in that organization or stay in that sector and actually you could do my role now in any of these organizations and probably like do do the role just like just as well as you could where you're comfortable but why like why should people go elsewhere and not be comfortable and challenge themselves and how do you get people to do that because that is how you get like the best value out of people sorry that was a bit long <laughs> brilliant thank you if i paraphrase what's the sort of spark that gets people moving in a uh, uh, into different jobs from different backgrounds paul do you want to kick off with that um yeah i mean i think uh, someone mentioned schools earlier and i, th I think talking mm. to people young people is very important um and I found that I didn't have that when I was at school so much, but when I went into schools to talk to them about being a consultant in the government practice, what happened was half the class suddenly decided they want to be in PDBC doing government <laughs> consulting, you know. And um, I said to them, you need to talk to some more people just because you might actually not like it, you might prefer something else. And I think there's been some research that said that, you know, that young people need to have you know, four or five different experiences of different you know, touch points of people doing di very different jobs to help them think about what the possibilities are. And then I think there's the important part about the confidence to get into those roles and apply for them in the first place. And that's where I think um, representation is important. And um, I think, and we go back to what you were saying, Bernadette, about the, the cabinet, I do think it's important that it's much more representative. Uh, I think that will inspire people. I, you know, I'm the first to criticize the government. I've done quite a lot of it in the last few years. Um, but I think it's a good thing for the country to see that. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to see it, frankly, because they probably would be 74% from public schools anyway, so they might as well be more varied. Um, question whether the, you know, it's the Prime Minister's job to get the different voices around the table to actually contribute, as we said before. But I do think seeing people from, uh, who, who you can identify with is very powerful, and it does build confidence for people to apply and see themselves in, in, in those roles. Um, and I think organisations need to do more once people are from different backgrounds have joined to sponsor them to make sure that they can progress because it's often that lack of sponsorship that people mm -hmm. from traditional backgrounds find very easily that enables people to, to progress. I was very lucky when I joined um, Price Waterhouse as it was then that I had a couple of partners who kind of took me under their wing and really um, stood in for the fact that I didn't know people further up the firm and that made a massive difference to me and I know not everyone gets that support. Mm -hmm. It's a bit random and I think one thing that DNI teams can do is to make sure that better sponsorship is available more broadly. Thank you. Um, another online question, I might direct this to Rupert in the first in instance, about remote and hybrid working from Adam viles -Moore. Um During the pandemic, big boost to access for work for a wide range of often underrepresented citizens. How to maintain this against 
uh, often philosophical rather than evidence-based return to the office, as uh, Adam puts it there. But, but um, <laughs> bottling the benefits of remote working um, so in this context. Yeah, the, there are lots of, <laughs> there are so many issues that organisations globally are facing with hybrid working. The fantastic fact that we can even do it, we should all celebrate that fact, but also the complexities that, uh, that come with it. And you know, like most organisational problems, it is uh, not an easy one to solve. So I think you, wanna, you certainly don't want the snap back to the way things used to be, where presenteeism was uh, you know, a real evil and unhelpful and not productive. But equally, I think we need to rec recognise that for some people during this particular period, um, it's not been uh, a particularly helpful experience. If you're joining an organisation, if you're a younger person joining an organisation, you're not getting the opportunity to socialise and learn um, indirectly that comes if you are with colleagues, more senior colleagues, uh, more experienced colleagues. Um, I think that uh, it can be a bit regressive uh, because it depends on whether you are able to work at home effectively and uh, what resources you've got access to, and is it environments conducive to that? For some people, coming to work is a respite, just the way it is for some children to go to school, it's a respite. So all of that needs to be, all of that needs to be taken into uh, account. The world will not be as it was. The world is not yet where it needs to be on this. So I'll just say the most frustrating type of experience is where some people are remote, working remotely, some people are working in a room and they're all clustered around one small monitor. Mm. That is too common in too many, in too many situations. So good, good, good challenge. Mm. Other thoughts on remote working and diversity and inclusion? I think, I think it's picking up on um, Rupert's point. We certainly can't go back um, to um, the way it was before, but I think having effective technology and investing absolutely. in that for the future, that's absolutely critical. If you're working from home, we need to make sure that people have the right kit. But I'm just thinking about the people whom, being able to work from home, their lives were transformed. Uh, people with young children who, you know, I was just thinking at the time when uh, my daughter's 22, at the time, you know, many decades ago, doing the school run, um, it was just, I spent half of my life on the trains. Um, so the ability uh, to work from home is life transforming. Uh, most of us are uh, living longer, so, at some point, most people will become carers at some point in their lives. So for carers, the ability to work from home is absolutely critical. And you know, thinking about what you were saying, Paul, about um, uh, role modeling, there are people who are carers for either because they have a, um, a disabled um, person or they're looking after someone um, who's got a, a condition. The ability to work from home, the the ability to continue their career without it stopping really you know, enables them to rise to whatever um, position they want to, if that's a senior position, and then role model to people who are younger carers and think that if Joe Bloggs can do it, I can do it too. And just thinking about people with disabilities, I mean, the ability to work from home for so many years, people you know, were told, oh, no, you can't work from home, you know, we don't do that over here. So it's been transformational. We cannot regress but we need the right, right tech, because if we don't have the right tech and the chairs and whatever paraphernalia we need, we'll be creating you know, long-term health conditions linked to muscular skeletal um, issues. So organizations need to really invest for now, for the future, but it's been transformational uh, from an inclusion perspective. It's certainly made us more inclusive in the way we work. Thanks, Bennett. Oh, they want it in the room, gentlemen. Thanks, uh, Chris Waterman, um, a baby boomer, disadvantaged kid from a coastal city, and they've come up again recently. Um, I had the dubious pleasure of being in the gallery at noon today, and I saw an incredibly diverse front bench until you thought about diversity of thought. They are mainly peas in a pod. Question, however, for um, and I'm going to put you on the on the spot, Rupert. Um, it's quite interesting that you chose to quote a zombie film, given your history. Um, 
And I think you might be looking through the wrong end of the telescope because the public sector um, employs care workers and learning support assistants. And here we are talking about the fast stream. When I used to train fast streamers, I wasn't invited back that often. I used to ask the young women in the room if their school uniform included a kilt. And it nearly always did, because kilts are expensive, they need dry cleaning, you can't take them up, and you can't let them down. So that's a subtle selection. But uh, for someone who is now head of this big shop, 3XO... Oh, <laughs> yes, indeed. Um, what is 3XO doing in terms of corporate social responsibility for the primary kids in the northeast, northwest, anywhere at all? Wow. Well, I, I wonder whether... Shall I, shall I go, go back to that? Uh, okay. Not sure you necessarily heard my earlier answer yeah. about... Uh, the importance of social mobility, the importance of apprenticeships, uh, the fact that we definitely, that's one of the best sources of diversity uh, of thought. Uh, if you want to know, I, I, don't, I won't do a plug for 3XO, I'm happy to talk to you about it afterwards. Uh, I would say that uh, two of us are on um, multi academy trust uh, boards and we feel very passionately about, about that. And uh, when we are able to, yes, we will, uh, I'm sure, do what you've uh, suggested. But uh, it's only been in existence for a few months. Great. Thanks, Rupert. <laughs> Let's have another question in the room, please. The gentleman there. Thank you. Uh, will Smith from the Charter Management Institute. Uh, I just wanted to ask the panel, it looks like the next couple of years are going to be dominated by a growth-led agenda, and so how would you suggest we case-build diversity in the public sector and like pin it to that agenda? So is it about talking about the efficiencies we can find? Is it about uh, kind of innovative service delivery? Is it just about kind of staff retention and turnover within HR departments? Mm -hmm. Great question. Georgia, do you want to kick off on that one? Yeah, I think, look, I think the, the, the number one argument for diversity is about creativity. And there's, you know, they, our data friend is gone, but there's a lot of data that shows if you have greater diversity, you have greater uh, creativity and you make better decisions. Um, but I think if, you, if, it, you're, if you're linking it to growth, I think it's about having a wider mission um, about, you know, diversity throughout all of our um, industries, and there, you know, there are large parts of our economy that still have massive issues uh, with diversity. So it's um, it's what you what you put in through from we were talking about schools from from primary school um, and the pathways through to those, and, and making that a societal mission um, will 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 help grow. Could I just say I think I think it's really interesting to talk about CMI and what you're and what you're doing because. Ultimately, diversity inclusion, I believe, is going to be driven by well-trained managers and leaders who know um, what they need to do to achieve the results we all want to achieve and have been, been talking about. And so, shameless plug for the CMI, um, which is that uh, you know, the ability to industrialise the, sta the standards which you're setting are really fantastic. And if we had a big step change, we know the UK has a productivity problem. One of the things that will solve that is a big step change in management capability. Actually, the civil service and the public sector, uh, I would say, coming into it and having left it, undersells itself as a source of good management and good managers. And I think that uh, if you look at what people are tackling in local government, in the NHS, in education as managers, they are dealing with massive problems with very limited resources, very tight timescales, and very high levels of transparency. Um, so coming in from the private sector to the public sector, I think one of the things people will th should be ready for is, is that. And uh, kudos to CMI for doing that stuff. Thanks, Rupert. Question here, just to Paul in the first uh, instance, um, uh, quite rightly reminding us about the other half of this discussion. Um, it says, from my experience, diversity is starting to improve. However, organisations are struggling with authentic inclusion. What can be done about that? Yeah, I think that... Um, as I was saying, you know, getting just diversity isn't enough. It has to be inclusive to give people the opportunity to speak and be heard. Um, so I think 
leaders in organisations have to be conscious of that. You know, when it, if, I, if, if, if I'm running a meeting, what's it like to be in my meeting? How easy is it to get heard? You know, do you just listen to the people who speak up or do you ask um, the shyer person perhaps or the person who's less confident perhaps before the meeting and encourage them to, to speak up, give them a platform? I talk to people about you know which which seat in the meeting do you take you know as simple as that you know to make sure you're sitting opposite the chair so you, that they notice you if you're trying to get their eye. So I think leaders have to be very conscious within um, in, with, about their style and make sure that they are inclusive. And then if that's done from the top down and the right example set, then I think organisations will, will get better at it. And then I think the other thing is for people outside the organisation, the customers, or the, you know, the people recipient of public services. The organisation needs to develop a culture which is, if you like, more empathetic towards them, uh, and it needs to understand them. And I, I, I encourage people at the at Met Police to think about this when they inter interact with communities, um, and try and develop that understanding. And it is much easier to, to do that if you have people from those communities inside who can talk to you openly about it. Some of these are quite difficult, touchy subjects that people don't like to talk about, and that gets in the way of that, developing that organisational empathy if you like as part of the culture and I think that's what you know those honest conversations and being thinking about the way you are in the in the in the day-to-day -day office situations is at the heart of these of changing the culture towards something more empathetic and understanding and inclusive. Thanks. Other thoughts on that? George? Just I think it's really important to have the difficult conversations and I think when when we talked about the journey we went on I think what's been critical to that is to create safe spaces um, where people can talk about their lived experience of of being an organisation, the microaggressions that they've uh, put up with or the, the kind of barriers that they see. And I think there was a kind of laziness um, that, that often that, that people don't have a confidence to apply to certain roles. But when you actually kind of had the conversations, actually there were there were kind of subtle signals that were given about who was hired that meant that people just thought there's no point even trying. And so I think really deeply getting underneath those conversations. And when you do, some difficult things come out of them. Um, but you, I think you have to go through that. It's like not, le it's, it's what you, you don't leave this kind of undercurrent that's unsaid. And I think that's the only way you can get kind of genuine kind of safe spaces and, and, and cultural change that, that is transformative. And, and just thinking about your question earlier, I think the other angle is around mental health. And, you know, I think part of, you know, uh, productivity is people being able to bring them ho their whole selves and love their work and to feel that it's meaningful and to do that you need to invest in them and 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 uh, you know what one one thing another interesting thing that came out of the conversation we had is we had this thing which was the Camden way and you know it was like every every interview was about the Camden way and everyone should kind of you know like you have those organizational values and actually what our staff said to us is what they felt is they had to fit themselves into that way and they they couldn't bring their individuality so kind of scrapped all of that and actually much more about what do you bring what do you bring that's different how do you bring your your lived experience and personality and culture into work and that's you, you we would never have got to that unless we'd kind of done the deep listening and created the safe spaces to to do that there's a question actually that builds on that a bit from deborah harris uh here who talks about you know, the evidence of people quiet quitting because of microaggressions or being othered mm. um, and thoughts um, about sort of persuading them to come back, rehiring from that pool. Um, uh, Bernadette? Um, I mean, certainly we need to demonstrate that things have changed. And I always say inclusion first before diversity. Why would I want to come back to your organisation? What is your people survey showing me? It hasn't um, bullying, harassment, discrimination has gone up rather than gone down. So I think there is something, and we did um, a bit of an experiment in the uh, DLUC department for leveling up before I left, where we looked at people who had left, we brought them back, held focus groups and found out why and, you know, would they come back and if they wouldn't, why. So I think it's, you know, if people want to engage, it's another set of data insights. But before we engage with these people, what has changed? You know, why would I come back and work within your organization? Um, will I feel loved? Will I uh, feel that I can thrive? Can, will I feel that I can give my best? But I think getting the insights from people that have left, getting insights also from people who have been part of your recruitment process is absolutely a, a valuable tool because you know, they have nothing to lose, so they will give you the unfiltrated um, feedback that you need to make improvements. So I think, you know, a lot of the time we think of data in some standard way. We can have, you know, creative thinking around how we gather data that will lead us. Um, it was um, 
I mean, that said data for action, so to, to help us to get the data set that we can mm -hmm. use to do something differently within organisations. One final question in the room. Does you want to go there? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, how is uh, equity uh, in the mix of uh, DNI in public sector, especially at uh, senior management level? Equity, did you say? Yes. Yeah. Uh, let's take that. Paul? Thoughts? Yeah, difficult question. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Tough one to finish you, with. Thank you. You mean equity as distinct from equality? Yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think uh, we, t we tend to talk a lot about diversity, then about inclusion, and the sort of E words are kind of sometimes further in, in the distance. Um, I, I, I always come back to, to representation being important because I think it, it's, more, it's more likely that people's interests will be, or their voices will be heard by a more diverse group of people. Um, but I think we struggle with equity because we tend to, towards equality of opportunity. And we, mm. think if we think if we're fair to everybody, then we'll get equity. But we know in our hearts, if we think about it, we have to do rather more. And it always struck me when we started trying to be more pro-social mobility at PDBC, we would advertise for opportunities to schools. And we would send the adverts. We would advertise on the website. And then within minutes, some people from some very good schools have got all the places napped. So we then thought, right, we'd get past that point. We'll just send the links directly to the schools we're interested in. But they were too busy doing other things to respond. And it, and it was, it was, it was, we found how hard it was to actually achieve equity by even just pushing beyond the obvious. You know, so just, OK, we, we, we're not even going to send it to these schools. And they still get in somehow. You know, it's, just, it's incredible. You know, so the system kind of fights back the whole time, and you have to, you have to, you have to work very, very hard mm. to avoid the biases in the system, in order to get to the outcome you want. Really quickly, Rupert, because we've hit time. But oh, sorry, I was going to say, up. I think we haven't used the phrase positive action, but actually that is one of the ways in which you will yeah. generate better equity. And those tools exist. You can do them in the law. There are good ways of doing them, and I think that's a really important thing. We see more of it and not be so, I think some people are a bit allergic to it as a concept, but it's an important concept to deal with the issues Paul's mentioned. Mm. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. Appropriately big question to end on. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Um, uh, thanks for everyone who's uh, here in the room today. Thank you to everyone watching online. Thank you for all the questions. Um, uh, apologies to those uh, I couldn't um, get to. Uh, and also big thanks to uh, PwC for partnering as well with, on this event and uh, a series of others in the lead up to it uh, and particularly to a brilliant panel for the discussion we've just had. Thank you very much. The, uh, live stream